So yesterday, what did we say? We were talking about an ammeter. We said for currents over about 10 milliamps, a shunt was used. And so let's take a look at an ammeter. I think if I draw it, then you can draw it. So we have a little ammeter here, and we'll put a little scale. What the hell are you doing? Oh, that's just wonderful. It's off by like three inches. I can't do that. You see that? No, cannot handle that. Yeah, it was working fine a minute ago. Well, that's how it's just going to start out today, huh? Let's all leave and come back in. Yeah. Well, it was working. There we go. Okay. So back to drawing a, the ammeter we're going to talk about. Make a little thing here. Comes down, we've got the, that'll represent the coil that wraps around it. So a coil always has two ends. So we got that end. Look at this end. Right there. All right, so those would be like my leads coming out. And then we have the um, magnet here. We'll just make it simple and just use the permanent magnets. There we go. Good enough. Okay, so we have this, this meter here. And we had talked about very small currents it can handle it because the small current is going to come up through these wires go through the uh, the movement right here that coil come back around and if we got oh on this particular one we said if we have up to about um, 10 milliamps we'd get a full scale deflection to the right and that would work but for anything else higher than that we had to have a what shunt something in parallel so our shunt a shunt resistor that would take the rest of the current through it and leave just a little bit to go through that coil up there. So um, as an example, let me see where we want to go to. So we'll start over here because I think I left off with F. So let's say consider an ammeter. An ammeter that requires that requires um, 0 0.01 amps to make a full scale deflection to make a full scale deflection and has a 5 ohm needle movement coil needle movement Oil, which is to say that this item right here is 5 ohms. So as long as I was measuring something that was no more than 0.01 of an amp, I'm good, right? If I measure 0.1 of an amp, what's that needle going to do? Vibrate. Full deflection. Everybody follow so far? It's important because I'm going to move on. And you'll be like, well, I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't, I don't Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so we talked about the ammeters and the meters, right? Okay. And so we talked about, I guess if I stand here and do it, it's better. We talked about this little coil right here. So if I measure something, if I measure something, um, some sort of circuit, We'll put the positive there and this over here. All right, so power is going to run through this. Of course, we've got to have a load and all kinds of stuff in there. Power is going to run through this. And we'll just say I'm measuring amps. Now, as long as I'm only measuring up to um, 0 0.01 amps or 10 milliamps, same thing, I'm going to have 10 milliamps is going to run up through here. We're going to get rid of this for the for the minute. Not worry about that. Um, back to here. So I'm going to have 10 amps run up through here, go through here. What happens when it goes to that coil? What does it become? 
a magnet. Okay, so it's going to come back out and around. So we're made of magnet, and these are magnets as well, north south. And so um, we'll say that this becomes the north, and this becomes the south, and they're going to repel each other and move the needle that way. All right. If I had five milliamps, it would read about right here, five milliamps. If I have 10 milliamps, it's going to be 10 milliamps. If I go over that, it's just going to peg it out. All right? Good. Glad you asked. So, and by the way, it's just, by the way, this little coil right here, is, it measures out at 5 amps. Okay, or 5, five amps, 5 ohms. Yeah, the magnets yesterday, I think it was a shoe or something? So the, the, the shoe, yeah, the, yeah, uh, uh, pole shoes. Uh, but these are just fixed magnets at this point. All right, so, so if you understand that, hopefully, we're going to take it one, one step further, Ohm's Law. And that's what this is really all about, is kind of an application of Ohm's Law. So that was fine. We can measure how much with this little meter? 10 milliamps. 10 milliamps. All right. So what if, if we want to measure 30 amps? We're going from 10 millis to 30 amps. We want to measure 30 amps with the same meter, the same meter. How can we do that? We've got to dial it down some down. Well, what did I say we use when we want to go to higher? OK, now we got a shunt. So the question is, what's that shunt supposed to be? We've got to do the math. All right, so how are we going to do the math? All right, let's go through it. So remember, remember, say, oh, my, we'll put that in. Remember, only um, 0 0.01 of an amp um, can flow through needle, can flow through the needle. And that'll give us a full scale deflection. All right. So if that's the case, how much, oops, how, how much, how much current needs to flow through the shunt? Through the shunt. Well, how much current? Oh, uh, 29.0 amps times 29 29.09? Wait, 29.99. 29.99 what? Oh, amps. Amps. Everybody see how we got that? Yeah. yeah. I got 30 amps coming in. Yeah? Yeah. So when you're switching um, settings, are you essentially just switching different resistors? Yeah in a sense. So I got 30 amps coming in. I want 0 0.01 to go that way. And I want 29.99 going this way. That doesn't sound too hard, does it? All right, let's see if we can figure that out here. She can't really say the words. <laughs> <laughs> Oop, <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if we can make it simple here. Um, that was it. So I, three, I think, was my point here. Three. How much current needs to flow through the shunt? And therefore, what is the resistance? What? is the resistance of the shunt, which is really the question. Well, what do we know so far? 29.99 Well, so we have E, I, and R of the shunt. The shunt is going to have how many amps? 29.99 .99 amps, and we're after R. Well, what is E? 
Where's my volts? We don't have it yet. All right, so how are we gonna figure that out? Let's, let's see if we can draw this just a little bit different here. Um, are they in series or parallel? Parallel. How do I know that? So, kind of a dummy like me, you like to draw things out in simple. Something I recognize. I love things I recognize. Let's see, E, I, and R. Do you recognize this by chance? It looks kind of familiar. And so we'll call this one right here the, um, the needle. This one can be the shunt. And I'm measuring how many amps? 30. I'm measuring 30 amps. See how easy this gets? How many amps went through the needle? And how many went through the shunt? All right. Well, what else do we know? Oh, look at you guys go. What was the needle resistance? What else can we solve? What is my volts? Point zero five volts. Hmm. How many volts do you suppose are over here? Point zero five. Oh, you guys are good. Point zero. How many volts over here? Point zero five. I feel like we've done this before. All right. So you've got enough information. What's my resistance? How hard was that? This, this starts out really hard, huh? Yeah. And it's like, how, are you, how am I ever supposed to figure something out like this out? <laughs> Just remember, it's, it, there's really nothing difficult in this electrical class. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I teach it. But when I designed it from the get-go, I'm always thinking about, well, I inherited the class, and then I changed a lot of it. But I'm always thinking, how can I make it not difficult, but simply reinforce the basics. So it just comes down to that. You know, you're going to learn a few other things as you go, but it's always going to come right back, circle around, usually to Ohm's law, which this just did. So it's just kind of a cool way of looking at that. So um, I can, now I can make it do anything I wanted to, right? I could say, well, what if I want to measure, because um, I have it my, let me see. Yeah, I don't need to do all that. Um, We'll just make up some of our own numbers here. Who cares? What if I wanted to measure 5 amps? What? Let me see. We'll do that. 5 amps. I'm going to measure 5 amps. You guys help me out here. What stays the same? Needle, Needle. Needle what? And current. Why does the current stay the same? Because the full deflection is 0 0.01 amps. Full deflection is 0 0.01 amps. Now, granted, that's all the way full scale. You know, I could say, well, what if I wanted it half scale? You, you know, but that becomes kind of a weird thing. It's like, so if you wanted half scale, what resistor would you put in to get half scale? What, so then if you really thought it through, you'd be like, well, why would you do that? So we'll just keep it at this. Say it doesn't change. It's 0.01 amps is the most that it can handle. And we're going to go full scale deflection. So if I said that I want five amps out of this thing, what resistor is going to be what I want to select? Who's lost? OK. <laughs> That's good. If you're lost, somebody else is too. So let me bring it back just a little bit. I don't want to repeat myself because it's like a I worry that then I'm saying the same thing. I'll say it slower and louder, and you tell me if that works, okay? So what we got here? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> too loud. Too loud. What we've got here 
is an exercise in Ohm's law, but it came around you in a weird way. Like you didn't see it come in Ohm's law, which is usually the case, right? Yeah. Who's done batteries? So if, who's doing batteries right now? Hannah did batteries. Hannah's actually listening with her head down. Um, <laughs> we were teasing you the other day because you don't listen this way. Oh, yeah. this, 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 I'm not a multitasker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't pick on Hannah a little bit. Um, all right, so Hannah did batteries. Ohm's Law, did it come sneaking around you some way? It, it was like I asked a question and she's like, it was almost like, are you freaking kidding me? I, I mean, I could just see her just like starting to pick up her books and walk out and she's like, forget it, I'm done. <laughs> And then it's like the lights come on. She goes, that's just an Ohm's Law question. I'm like, yeah, it is. So and then it was like, boom, she like nails it. So that's just one of these things. It's an Ohm's Law thing sneaking around at you. So what I did is I drew this, this meter here. And, and do you understand that in the meter we talked about yesterday, it takes a certain amount of current flow, amps, to make the electromagnet to make the needle deflect, right? And if I give it too much current, what happens to the needle? It pegs out. It's okay. It's completely useless. So we have these settings inside of our meter. And this is a little more simplistic than it really is, but not by far. So if I built it this way and I said, well, this only measures up to 0.1 of an amp. And what if you wanted to measure two amps? Well, then you'd have to go buy another meter with a different coil built in right here that has a different resistance. Okay, but the meter people are smart. They figure, well, we're just going to make this, this uh, electromagnet right here fixed. And every time you change the dial, you change this resistor right here, the shunt resistor. Okay, so the question became, what resistance should this shunt be right here? And I'm going to go to, let me see, pick up a, kind of the same thing. Let me see. I just gotta remember where I want to go here. Up one. There we go. So with the resistor there on the shunt, would that be a variable resistor? Sure. Or or not, and the switch would just select different ones. Oh, okay. Um maybe forget what I was doing. Make fun of Hannah for there we go. There we go. This is what we're looking at, drawn nicely. This is the <laughs> Practically the same, but that has the answer on the bottom. Okay, and the whole question was, what if I want to measure 30 amps? Well, I know the all that can go through this right here, the max that can go through here is how much? 0 .01. 0.01 amp through this, which means that if 0 .01 is going this way, and I have 30 coming in, how much is going this way? Well, it's 30.00 minus 0 0.01, so that's 29.99 amps has to go this way. So we have 29.99 amps going this way. Got it? And so then I just had to figure out my E, I, and R for the whole series, which I found was easier to draw out um, this way. That's just this one right here. So that's E, I, and R. And I know that the I is 0 0.01. And then I came over here. And that is this one over here. And I know that's E, I, and R. And I know that is 29.99 amps. Follow so far? Yeah. OK. But then like any Ohm's Law circuit, I'm looking for more information. And of course, I put a battery here just to represent the total that's coming in because I always do E, I, and R totals. So then I go, well, what information do I have? Well, I have this right here. It's hidden, but it's up there. So that's five ohms. Well, now I just do Ohm's law, E, I, and R. So E then becomes I times R. So five times 0 0.01 is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, right? 0 0.05. 0 0.05? Thank you. 0 0.05 volts. Well, it's a parallel circuit. So that means the voltage is going to be the same everywhere. So that means it's 0 0.05 volts right here. And the question was, 
what size resistor do I need? So I could have, in, a, in another way, just said, in a, in a parallel circuit where you have uh, I total is 30 volts and I of 1 is 0 0.01 amps and the resistance is 5, calculate the rest of the circuit. I probably could have done that and you would have had it in just a minute. So now we know that the resistance is E divided by I, which ends up being 0.00167 ohm. Very small amount. And, and why is it so small? You want all the current going that way. Well, you're kind of focusing on the wrong thing, but um, <laughs> I suppose on the test, if I saw 0 0.002, I would know that you understood it. May not be on the test. All right, so then, then I just said, we'll discard that. I said, well, what if I changed all that around and I said, well, I just want to measure 5 amps. Now, what is my resistance? And the, the process remains pretty much the same. The needle isn't changing at all. So it's still 0.05 volts. This is still 0.05 volts. But my current is going to change. So it'll be uh, 4.99, which gives the resistance of 0 0.01002 0 0 ohms. All right. And we, of course, could do this all day with different things. But now we're just getting right back into kind of week one. Yay! <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I so appreciate when people tell me they're lost because it makes me a better teacher. It makes me think about what I'm saying and how I can rephrase things and bring it back around to, to what people understand. I want to simplify it. I don't want it to be complicated. And, and um, you shouldn't be afraid of electricity, uh, the questions and everything. It's just... There's no magic in it. Uh, oops, wait a minute. So that's 10, that's 11. So those are done. So 10, 11. Make sure I got everything. So an ammeter, regardless of what I just wrote. No, not regardless of what I wrote. We'll look at it. An ammeter has very, very low, low, resistance. low resistance. How low is it? Very low. Like 0.00. Okay. Hannah, what was the resistance of the wires? What would that be? 0.7? Yeah. Okay. So. We were playing around with the resistance on some wires, which, which brings up a, a good point. If I have a battery, and I have, this should look familiar, and let's say I have six amps, and um, what do I want to say? We'll say two volts. Um, what is my resistance total? Three. No, three divided by six. Point three. Point three ohms. Okay. In theory and math, that would be correct. And so then you would expect this to be two volts, six amps, and point three ohms, right? Okay. But let's just say, and, and I'll make this red. So this is a wire. This is a red wire right here. I want to know. I want to know what. And, and can I measure resistance total uh, of, of this circuit yeah. while it's connected? No. no. <laughs> okay. And also, I'm talking about 0.3 of an ohm. How well can you measure 0.3 of an ohm? No, you really can't, can you? Okay, so let's just kind of get rid of that. We can't really do that very well. But this resistor is printed on it 0.3. Okay, so we can calculate this out and know that we've got something going on like that. So let's just say, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll put an ammeter in here and 
the ammeter says six amps. So, okay, so I know it's, it, it is in fact six amps because I'm measuring it. And I want to know, does this particular wire right here have any resistance? Well, how am I going to figure out if that wire has any resistance? Check the wire on its own with no power. Okay, so I take the wire out and you guys have your wires. Have you tried that? Does it seem like they have any resistance? You did that continuity check. Did they have any? Uh, very, very, it's, it's like unmeasurable, right? Okay. How else could I figure out the resistance of that wire? It's Ohm's law sneaking back around at you. Ohm's law. You simply take this right here and you think of it, well, what if this has got a resistor to it? Okay, it becomes an EIR problem. How many amps are going through the wire? Six. You know it's six because you're measuring it down here, so six amps. So then I take a voltmeter and I put it right here and I come over here and I come over here. What should the voltmeter read? Zero. For those of you that said zero, thank you. Is there a difference of potential? No. No. But you just happen to read on there because voltmeters can actually read pretty low, can't they? Your Simpson, you can rearrange so full scale deflection is one volt. So even a Simpson, so let's just say I get 0 0.0, I'm just making it 0 0.05 volts on that. Put it here, 0 0.05 volts on that. So what is my resistance? Oh. 0.008. 0.008 ohms. Do you think you could have measured 0 0.008 ohms anywhere? No, but you just did it. You just figured out the resistance of that wire. Mm. That's pretty cool. It's actually, to me, it's more accurate. It's way more accurate because you can get down to this point zero zero eight. That's realistic right there. Right. It's with a, with an old Simpson meter. That's a realistic thing to do. That's practically new. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. But you have to have a, a large current draw. Okay. okay, if you don't have a large current draw, then it doesn't work. So that's why this, this one worked because I gave it six amps. Now, if I said it's six milliamps, I mean, good luck. I mean, well, let's, let's just do that real quick because that's fun for me. So <laughs> let's just change this EIR right here and just say it was six milliamps. Okay, and, and do the resistance of the wire We'll still call it 0 0.008 just for fun. Um, I don't think you would see the same resistance because you're not running the same amount of current through it. But just for fun here, what would the voltage drop have to be to get that? 0 0.048 millivolts. You're gonna have a hard time measuring that. So that's why I gave it six amps to begin with, so you could see that. So when you start getting up into amps. And so in order that would be something you could do with a starter wire. It's something, but you're not gonna really do it with uh, nav lights and stuff. Yeah. Um so um I think the problem where like if the if E equals 0 0.05 volts and I equals six millivolts. No, the amps. Yeah. And, but I got 8.3 ohms. So I'm sorry, what did you do? So the resistance went really high, obviously, because the current is really low. I'm you have to start again. What did you do? <laughs> so I did E equals 0 0.05 volts, and I did I equals 6 millivolts. Milliamps. Milliamps. Okay. Yeah, and you got 8.3 repeating for resistance? So, yeah, so I got 8.3 for my resistor because... Right, and that would make sense. And the reason why is because if you actually got a 0.5 volt drop out of only six milliamps, that's a big resistor. Oh, I see. see, what I did is I changed it so that we were running less amperage through it, but we assumed that the wire resistance stayed the same. Oh, I see. Then what would that look like on a voltmeter? You wouldn't see it. So that is to say that when you get into tiny voltages, you don't notice this resistance in wires. But when you start adding more and more power, you start to see 
these resistances start to show up and have a huge effect. You know, uh, we could run 60 amps through it and uh, the wire would just melt, so then it'd be an open, so. Isn't there like a rule of thumb you lose so much per foot of yeah. white wire? Yeah. What is that rule of thumb? We're gonna talk about that next. But it's not really so much a rule of thumb, it's a chart, because we're very accurate. So, all right, everybody follow that one there? All right, so an ammeter has very low resistance and it's placed in series. I don't think I need to write that. Um, let me see. I will write this part here just because, you know, it's not difficult to do and it's worth writing. Seven. Don't know what number you're on. I'm on seven. Also, the other part of the problem with my uh, outlines is I do skip things. I am now. <laughs> oh, meter. All right. So, very basics, it measures resistance. Measures resistance. It takes readings with power what? In the OFF position. Only for free? Okay, it works on the same principle, same principle as a voltmeter, which is to say that a certain amount of current goes through the needle movement, which creates an electromagnet, which fights against a permanent magnet or another electromagnet, which <coughs> makes it move. We've already did that. Um, CD. An internal battery, which you now know, internal battery, it provides power for needle movement. Internal battery provides power for needle movement. So we have this internal battery. So you must zero out, zero out the meter. When? Beginning of the day? Every time. Every time. Every time you switch. At each setting. At each setting. Um, I would say at, at, at each setting. Before measuring. Before measuring, yes. Yeah, that would be good. We could write that because I notice how you guys tend to do it. And just because I worked in a production setting and it was important when you get out in the field that you work smart. I don't want to say work fast because we're in aircraft mechanics. First you work correctly Correct and proper work builds speed over time. So some of you like to measure, then take it off, then zero it out, then measure. You can skip the first part where you measure it and take it off and then zero it. I don't know if you know that, but uh, you can skip that part. That's just a trick of the trade. We just zero it out, then measure. Yeah, I, <laughs> I should write that down. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. So why, why do we have to zero it out? Because the battery, the battery, the ba my notes say the battery gets weaker, but I think it's really a battery gets weaker. And the battery starts wearing out and changes the supplied voltage and changes the supplied voltage. So that's why you got to zero it out. And zeroing it out, the, um, we'll call it the zero out knob. Zero out knob. Controls, controls a variable resistor. Um, 
also known as a rheostat or potentiometer. All right, switching gears. Yeah, reverse. Oh, I'm not covering this anymore. So I used to cover schematics in this class, but before I could cover schematics, I had to spend an entire day explaining how landing gear worked. And so I have moved this over to Larry. So Larry will now take care of this. But, you know, you guys really should know this in a way, a lot of it. Um, what you don't know is the part about how landing gear works and how horns work and the nuances of all of that. But since it's up here in front of me, I thought, hey, you know what? Why don't we just go through it? That was just something I thought about. So not on the test, so you can relax. But you need to know some of the stuff you're working with right now, so it's very helpful to you. All right, so this is a landing gear circuit right out of your Q&As. And in a landing gear circuit, we have landing gear that go up and down. Um, the green lights represent down and locked. And this particular um, one, I think only has, uh, I think it's a tricycle gear. There's two mains and a nose wheel. And it's a little bit of a complicated system. Uh, but you want the green light to light up when the gear is down and locked. And the red light here represents the gear is up and locked. And if you look at these little lights right here, they're kind of funny looking because you have a number eight wire coming in and a number 18 wire coming in. And if you look at that, I think I can actually do this. There we go. I can't do that. You, you can see these two lights coming in and you can see there's a space right there. So 18 doesn't do anything, does it? No. It's open. Mm -hmm. So what is that about? Well, imagine you are, you're flying along and you're coming in to land and you put your gear down and you look over and you do not have a green light. That means you're either about to belly in or a cheap little light bulb is burnt out. All right, so that is a test. It represents that if you push on the bulb, it goes down to this 18 wire here, which is directly connected to a circuit breaker. So, so 7 and 18 are just hot all the time. So if you push on the bulb and the bulb light does come on, you got a gear problem. If you push on the bulb and it doesn't come on, you probably have a bulb problem. <laughs> yeah. So that that is what that is, and that's really kind of what I want to do with you guys. Just go over what some of these things are. Okay. So looking at this, I want you guys just to pick up on some things. Number one, a bus bar. You can see what a bus bar looks like and how it's drawn, and it's fine. Just put bus on there. And this is how it really is in an airplane. The circuit breaker is actually attached to the bus bar. You don't want to do a wire, then go to a circuit breaker if you can help it. Some aircraft are that way. Um, and the reason why is because if there's a wire and then the circuit breaker, if anything happens to that wire and it catches on fire, there's, there's nothing to stop it. You got to turn off the aircraft master. So it's really common to see, I know my, all, all the Cessnas do that. They just screw right to this bus bar. And what is this bus bar? Uh, my 182 looks like they picked up a piece of aluminum out of the scrap bin and just drilled some holes in it. That's all it is. Um, I think my 152 looked like they took a piece of copper tubing and smashed it. I think they really did because if you looked at it on end, you can see almost two pieces that rolled. And it's like, it's just a piece of copper tubing you smashed into a flat plate. So, all right, without spending too much time on this, uh, what kind of switch is this right here? Double pull, double throw. What is the movable part? The pole. What is the immovable part? The throw. Okay, so this right here is the pole. So it's got two poles. This dashed line means that they are connected 
physically, but not electrically. So notice how 19 wire comes up and attaches here, and the two wire attaches here. That means the two is getting its power to go up and down, and the 19 is getting this power to go this way or this way. I have never seen a switch in aviation where one, like 19 is a ground and two is a power. I don't ever see that where they bring a power and a ground in next to each other because now you're putting a power and a ground inside of a switch and switches break and I wouldn't want to have a power and a ground capable. They usually just have power and power, which is what you have here. Uh, five is power and two works its way around somewhere. Yeah, I was just going to pick up its power. I, but uh, now I won't worry about it. Okay, so double pull, double throw. Uh, again, a gear safety switch. Uh, aircraft have, sometimes they call them a wow weight on wheels. Uh, I use the word squat switch. And it's just a switch that when the strut compresses, there's a scissor link and the scissor links come down as the strut compresses because the aircraft's on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then it hits a switch that says, I'm on the ground now. And it keeps the, uh, if you select gear up when it's on the ground, it keeps it from in inadvertently uh, raising the gear up. So um, we got the down limit switch. It's again, what kind of switch? Double pull, double throw. Double pull, double throw. Okay, what kind would this be? Single pull, double throw. Double throw. Single pull, single throw. Oh, wait, no. Single pull, double throw. Single pull. Single pull. Single pull. So how many? No, single pull, double throw. Single pull. Single pull. It's <laughs> only one moving part. So, yeah. So, okay, so go back to this one. We know it's double pull. Double pull, meaning the move apart. So there's two movable parts. Double pull. This is a single pull. And how many places to connect? One, two. All right. Um, okay, relays. You guys are, with your motor project, you're working on relays a lot. This is the preferred schematic for me for a relay because it's what it looks like and it makes sense to me. So you can see that in this particular case, this number 12 wire would be a very tiny little wire. A normal size wire, I don't know, it's not really that small. Because it's only gonna carry a very small amount of current. Maybe, let's try and follow it back around. Well, it's connected to a 20 amp. That's why this is a weird one. So, um, oops, it didn't go that way. But anyway, it's a very small wire. But this number 14 is going to be a pretty fat wire because it's got to operate the motor. Now, what I don't like about this is they represent that all of this power is going to go through this gear switch, which is kind of weird to me because switches don't normally handle that kind of power. Uh, but anyway, so this is a relay. It's a remote-controlled, electrically-operated... It's a remote control, a wired remote control. There we go, wired remote control. So you can see power comes in, goes through the coil, goes to ground. That is, the, that is one circuit completely isolated. The dash lines mean that it is not connected electrically, but in this case, it's connected via um, magnets. So the magnets will then pull this down and make contact. And this, this is a steel bar probably. So it's a pretty healthy little little thing there. So that's enough of that because otherwise we get. All right. Not gonna talk about that right now. I'm just looking at what I have here. Oh yeah. All right, so talking about symbols. Not the kind that you wrote. Symbols. All right. Well, the easiest one is, uh, start with the easiest, a conductor. What's another word for a conductor? A wire. A wire. And the symbol for that is? A line. There you go. All right. But what we have to do is we have to look at more than that. So this is the older older convention, I mean the older way of doing things. So this right here is connected. So those two wires are connected 
and then this would be not connected. And then the newer convention would look like this. So this would be connected. And this would be not connected. And the thing that sucks is they are the complete opposites, the older and newer. So it's the same drawing on the newer is not connected. On the newer, it's connected on the old one. So you always have to look at how they are connected to understand the drawing, and then you then you get it from there. So that's what I'm always looking for. It's got the dot, then I'm going to expect this to be not connected. If uh, then I have the little underneath or over the top, then I know that's what's going on there. So while we're drawing up our diagram, would you rather use the older or the newer I don't have a preference. I will follow whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy, as long as it looks neat and it's drawn in a professional manner. What do I mean by a professional manner? Neat. Don't use a ruler. Yeah. Why, why is that important? Because if we end up doing something... I mean, it's not. I'm not a drafter. I don't teach drafting class. I suck at drafting, and so I don't like doing it. I'll tell you that right now. But... I like that. It's a great answer. For the next person that reads it. You know, if there's any ambiguity and you misread it, you burning up something or causing damage. Whenever you are actually drawing up stuff like this for aircraft, it usually means that you're doing some sort of major alteration or repair. Otherwise, why would you be drawing it? It's already in the manual. You just follow what the manual says. But if you're adding something, you're changing something, which happens a lot in aircraft, then you're going to make a drawing. What happens to that drawing? It goes on a form 337, an FA form 337 that is sent to Oklahoma City and made part of the permanent aircraft records. So, you know, Harry has a 47, 1947? Yeah, 140. Cessna 140. Call back to Oklahoma City, give them the end number, five bucks, tell them you want it. They're going to send you a disc that you open up. It has all the 337s and drawings that airplanes ever had. So whatever you do to that airplane is going to be part of the permanent records with your name on it. So you want it to look nice. It represents you. Uh, somebody once said, what are you going to do when your grandkids like, I want to be an aircraft mechanic like my grandpa, you know, and then they, or my grandma. And uh, sorry. So, <laughs> and so, you know, and they called Oklahoma City and they get this like, ugh. My ancestors were terrible. So, <laughs> never mind. I want to, I want to be much better. So, all right. Um, let's just stop there and have dinner. Yeah.